So walk us through it. Let's have that discussion. What does Medicare and Medicaid look like over the next 10 to 15 years? Well, let me just, let me just say something, um, you know, and you can watch me. I will use no phrases, nothing. I'm just going to describe why I, as a policy person, have concerns with Chairman Ryan's plan based on the Congressional Budget Office analysis. Most of what you hear in the discussion is the fact that, as you mentioned, a beneficiary in 2022 would have to pay $6,400 more than they would in the current system, $6,400 more, and that amount grows with time. That's where most of the discussion's been. Let me go to another part of that calculation. What that same Congressional Budget Office analysis shows is that overall, under his plan, as analyzed by Congressional Budget Office, we will spend $5,700 more per Medicare recipient. So let me just make sure everybody's clear on that. The goal of most health reform is, is not just to shift from one side of the ledger to the other, but to see if we can do reforms that lower the amount we as a society spend on health care. His plan by CBO would take uh, 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 would mean in 2022, instead of all of us together spending about $14,000 for uh, per Medicare recipient, it would be about $20,000. We'd be spending $5,700 more per Medicare recipient. Now ask, how much is the government saving? The government saves about $615 per recipient. So I hate to use so many numbers, but here's the basic deal. It does not show that we are uh, spending less. It shows that by having the private sector involved in this, that you end up paying extra for the administrative cost, the underwriting cost, the advertising cost, the profit cost. And you're basically saying that we're going to pay this much more. Mostly, the recipients are going to pay $6,400. And for what cause? So that the government can save $615 per recipient? Now, that's not my analysis. That is the Congressional Budget Office. Chairman Ryan says, you know, maybe it will be more efficient. Okay, I'll give it to him. Let's say it's 10% more efficient. It still makes very little sense. And so I think you have to look and ask, is that the type of reform we want? And do we feel comfortable changing the entire structure of Medicare from something where there's a bit of a basic package that people can count on to something um, uh, uh, completely very new uh, when the Congressional Budget Office, at the chairman's request, analyzed their plan so it could come out on the same day he announced it and found that it was going to mean that we as a society were going to spend $5,700 more per Medicare recipient in 2022. So what is your plan? So our plan, uh, we do a few things. First of all, we are having involved in serious discussions that are going on right now as part of the Biden group and we're willing to look line by line through many of the traditional savings that have been put forward by Congressional Budget Office, by many of the bipartisan groups. Uh, we, for one, would you know, use more uh, leverage in terms of the, uh, uh, on the purchase of drugs. Uh, we think there are still savings that we can get in efficiencies in our, in our payment system. And we've committed publicly that we're willing to do $470 billion of Medicare and Medicaid savings over the next 12 years. And the IPAB does do something which we think is important. It means that we may not have it all right, but we're going to set up an independent body of authorities. Six of them would be chosen by Republicans, six by Democrats uh, uh, in the Congress, and that this group of experts would look on a year-by-year -year basis. And if Medicare spending was growing too much, it would never be on automatic pilot again. A group of experts would be forced to present options to the Congress that they either had to act on or be implemented. Again, maybe that could be done better, but it does not deserve the kind of disparagement it has. It's a very serious proposal, and maybe there's a better way to do it, and we're all ears uh, in trying to have that type of bipartisan discussion. If the current health care law is effective, why are there so many waivers? Are there 1,000 waivers? Are you talking about for Medicaid or no, for Medicare? No, the, the health care law. Well, when I think when you're doing, uh, I think when you're doing um, um, 
any kind of things. That we've always had this federal system where we try to create a, uh, um, uh, you know, we try to create a, a you know, a, a systems for our countries, and we've always had uh, options for flexibility, and that's part of the um, laboratory of democracy that we have in our country. So, in Medicaid, for example, people can apply for 11, 15 waivers, and that can give them the ability to experiment, have more authority. But we make sure when that's happening that it's not going to mean less coverage for very poor people or things that are destructive, um, and uh, so. Uh, again, I think the fact that we have waivers, uh, that kind of flexibility, is a positive, not a negative. It shows that we're not trying to do one size fits all. And so, for example, on the exchanges, we've said that if a state can come forward with a different system that they think is better and covers the same number of people, they can do so. Which again shows that this really is about you know whether somebody else actually has a better idea or whether they simply are deciding that it's okay to not cover 34 million Americans going forward and continue to have those costs shifted to hospital, shifted to premiums as hidden taxes. I mean, our status quo on health care is not acceptable, and, and that is why the Affordable Care Act is the right thing to do. And I think, again, uh, our goal as an administration is not just to have every single thing exactly as we, as we designed it the moment it passed. What we would like is to have a constructive conversation where people recognize that we have put into this virtually every good idea people have had for more coordinated care, for more efficient care, for aligning payment with the right incentives, not rewarding or letting hospitals get away with readmissions that are completely unnecessary. Uh, these are all the, the good policies. If we didn't get it exactly right, let's have a discussion about it as opposed to deciding you're going to name something the repeal the job killing health care act and make that simply uh, uh, you know, a political soundbite, a political message when we're supposed to be talking about this important issue. And if, if you think this is separate from Medicare, it is not. Let's be very clear about one thing. The main reason that Medicare costs are going up in our country for spending is that we have had the long-awaited aging of our population. In 2020, in 2000, when I left as NEC director under President Clinton, there were 45 million people on Medicare. Uh, today, in 2020, there will be 70 million, 25 million more. That is going to increase costs. That's why we did all the fiscal discipline in the 90s, so that we were ready for that. The growth for each enrollee is about 2.92%. That is lower than the growth of health care in the private sector. So if you're not doing the type of things that is bringing down costs in the overall system, you are likely to be back to the game of shifting costs from one party to the other instead of us as an economy trying to figure out how we can spend less overall. It's just worth noting that the costs have been so significant for companies and other institutions that they have balked to the extent that they have actually received waivers, a, a significant number. But let me move on to Social Security. Why didn't you attack Social Security? Why didn't we? Attack Social Security in terms of trying to cut Social Security services over the 10 to 12 year period. Look, I would say it's pretty clear the Obama administration is a bit the person in the middle on Social Security. There's no question that we have some people, many of the groups that we support and work with, who would like us to take Social Security completely off the table. We have, unfortunately, most of the Republicans, virtually all, uh, so far saying that they will only do Social Security reform if you do the entire reform by cutting benefits. That's not how Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan did it in 1983, and that's not how it will ever get done. So I think that uh, the President made clear in the State of the Union, he made clear in his, uh, when he laid out his $4 trillion deficit reduction plan, that while we do not think you should, Social Security should be used as a device that's designed to lower the 10-year deficit, that we do think we as, as a country would be better off dealing with protecting uh, its core purposes, its rock-solid progressive benefit, and its solvency earlier as opposed to later. And what we're really looking for is, uh, is folks from the other side to be willing to come to the table without this ideological, not a penny of revenues, and talk about how we could do this in a balanced way, 
doesn't slash current benefits, uh, uh, still protects those with disability, still keeps it a rock solid benefit. So we have not taken it off the table, but this is an area where we need, uh, we, we, need, we need those who could help pass this to be willing to have a balanced conversation about it. And, and to be fair, Chairman Ryan also did not attack Social Security as I, as I referred to it earlier. Defense spending cuts. So uh, it is true that prior to the president's recent plan that our defense budget actually increased the deficit by about 180, 190 billion dollars over the 10 year window. We have now put out uh, a budget target that actually uh, reduces the deficit, reduces spending, so it reduces deficit by 290 billion. So that's a over 450 billion dollar swing. Uh, so we've made a pretty serious move on defense spending, and I think we're doing so because we recognize that you just can't have this kind of comprehensive deficit reduction effort, a sense of shared sacrifice. If you take any major area of the budget and just say it is completely off the table, this is difficult. The president's the commander in chief. He's not at a think tank. He has to work this through in a very serious way with his joint chief of staff and secretary of defense, but we've made a pretty significant commitment uh, recently, which is one of the reasons we were able to get to $4 trillion uh, over 12 years in our budget. Such a serious commitment that, in fact, Chairman Ryan's team says Bob Gates has said that your spending cut proposals are not viable. Well, you know, let's... Have you heard Bob <laughs> Gates weigh in on this? I am... Uh, the, the president and chief of staff and vice president have had many conversations with the Secretary of Defense, and I am party to some of those, but I'm not going to discuss them here. I think we're all on the same team, and, they, and I think he understands that defense has to be part of the overall effort to get uh, our budget under control. Okay. 